Okay, welcome to everybody uh, to uh, the June seminar in the Living with Disability Research Centre series. Um, I'd just like to start with acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which uh, Bandura campus from where we're broadcasting is the land of the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, if you haven't joined us before, welcome. Um, we will, we've got three segments in this afternoon session. We'll have questions after each presentation. If you've got questions or you want to make a comment, then you need to put them in the Q&A um, and we'll moderate those questions. So the slides will be available and the recording will be available on the Living with Disability Research Centre website um, by the beginning of next week. Um, so this the whole session focuses on uh, work, health and safety um, and quality and safeguarding for people with intellectual disabilities primarily, uh, although it does also have a broader focus and includes other people with disabilities. So our first speaker is Dr. Alan Hoff, um, who will be familiar to many of you. He runs a consultancy called Purpose at Work and he's an adjunct professor with the Living with Disability Research Centre. Um, and has published quite extensively on uh, boards, regulation, and now work health and safety. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Alan um, for the first uh, presentation. Over to you. Thanks so much, Chris, and thanks to everybody joining the webinar. So what I'll be covering is um, a study looking at all the work health and safety uh, prosecutions and uh, what's called an enforceable undertaking in relation to service provision to people with disabilities. And so the first component will be looking at lessons for service providers. After that, we'll have a break. Then I'll hand over to Drew, and Drew will be using the same data to identify issues for policymakers and regulators. Again, a short break, and then I'll be picking up prosecutions by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, and the first cases we've had of those. I want to um, warn everybody that this um, seminar is not for the faint-hearted. We're going to be talking about the deaths of people supported, workers, and in one case, the death of a worker's unborn child. For any Aboriginal people present on the webinar, I need to mention that we will be talking about the death of Aboriginal people and I will be using their names as it's recorded in the case law. If for any reason uh, this webinar is not for you, uh, please exit now and do make sure that you look after yourself during and after the webinar. So um, the study we undertook was in relation to uh, work health and safety enforcement of service provision to people with disabilities. We took a broad understanding of what uh, service provision means. So we're not just talking about service provision uh, of the type normally uh, provided by uh, disability service providers. We also pick up schools and in one instance, it also picks up a hospital. My approach in analysing the cases or our approach in analysing the cases is uh, based around a number of principles. First one is that it's absolutely essential that providers and workers work to eliminate preventable harm to people with disability being supported and to workers. But as you will see from when we get into the uh, cases, uh, with only some exceptions, I think anybody who's ever been involved in disability service provision will respond to some of them by going there, but for the grace of God go I. In a very important uh, study of um, from the military of uh, helicopters being shot down, US helicopters being shot down by US troops, um, the author of that study, Snook, 
talked about the importance of moving beyond analysis of these sorts of tragedies from thinking about bad people engaging in bad behaviour to one of realising that, well, most people could commit uh, these sort, make these sorts of mistakes and that what we really are talking about is good people struggling to make sense of their circumstances. Now, there will be some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, that's the approach we take. I will be mentioning the number of cases where people with intellectual disability have engaged in assault, physical assault, or even sexual assault. And I'm certainly not generalizing from those limited number of cases to suggest that all people with intellectual disability constitute a risk or in the case of a murder by a person by, with psychosocial disability, that all people with mental illness uh, 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 present risks. The two publications you'll be able to find um, uh, by Googling. Uh, so the first paper uh, is called Lessons for Service Providers. The second paper is called Issues for Policymakers and Regulators. I'm aware that there's been some recent research released by WorkSafe Victoria um, based uh, following a study by some academics at QUT. Um, I haven't been able to locate that uh, paper on the WorkSafe Victoria uh, website, but that also will be worth looking at. So for the research, we attempted to locate every decision on prosecutions or enforceable undertakings in relation to service provision to people with disabilities in Australia. Now, the meaning of a prosecution is straightforward. That's where um, a regulator um, or uh, the uh, director of public prosecutions uh, commences criminal proceedings against either a worker or a provider. You might not be familiar with the term enforceable undertaking, and this is uh, typically made where a provider is alleged to have done the wrong thing. And what the provider says to the regulator is, look, we undertake to do these things. Um, and in return, you will undertake not to prosecute us. This shouldn't be seen as a uh, light option necessarily. Um, some regulators take uh, the approach of um, thinking how much uh, a provider would have to pay by way of fine and then requiring them to spend three times that amount in the enforceable undertaking, in fulfilling the enforceable undertaking. To locate the cases, we use legal databases. So uh, for those uh, familiar with them, uh, we used OSPLI, we used JADE, uh, and also the CCH specialist database. And we supplemented that search by using the databases maintained by the work health and safety regulators on their websites. And I sat there for what seems like days uh, going through each of those case listings. Um, we can't be confident that we've caught every case. Uh, for example, the databases maintained by the regulators do not always capture not guilty findings. And so I'm aware of one such finding in Victoria, um, which has not been publicly reported. In analysing the cases, this wasn't um, a sort of research project where you had to um, do very fine coding from within Navivo. In many ways, the lessons were obvious, but um, they are nonetheless profound. They're simple, but they're profound, as we will see. So we're looking at cases which are of prosecution in relation to disability service provision, which commenced in 1999. Um, of course, that, that legislation has been in place for a lot longer, but that's the first case we could locate in relation to disability service provision. Since 1999, legislation has changed across time, uh, but nonetheless, we believe that most of the lessons are generalizable. By way of background, all states and territories other than Victoria follow the national model work health and safety laws, although there can be some differences in matters such as penalties. Um, Western Australia only recently caught up um, in 2022 and adopted the model laws. 
Victoria, by comparison, uh, has an Occupational Health and Safety Act, which uses slightly different terminology uh, compared to the model laws. And there's some differences in the duties established by the legislation. But uh, one shouldn't overstate the differences between the Victorian legislation and the national model legislation, because they're both outcomes-based and they're both based in risk minimization principles. We identified 27 cases all up. 20 cases concerned disability service providers, including governments when they were such providers. Six concerned schools, including one school inside a youth detention centre, and one case concerned a hospital. Of the 27 cases, there were four enforceable undertakings and 23 prosecutions. 24 of the cases uh, concerned providers, three prosecutions concerned individual workers. As yet, there's no cases um, on directors and officers of organisations which have been resolved, but Integrity Care South Australia and its directors are currently before the courts following the death of Anne-Marie Smith. So Integrity Care has been charged with breach of its work health and safety duties. The directors have also been charged with that offence and also the general criminal offence of criminal neglect leading to death. Of the 27 work health and safety cases, 18 cons cases concerned harm to workers, two cases concerned harm to workers and clients, and seven concerned harm to clients alone. One of the things that uh, Drew will be raising in his presentation is that we believe that in many cases, harm to clients has been made invisible. Crimes against people with disability have been made invisible. And obviously, uh, we believe that's a very poor regulatory outcome. Of the 27 cases, 14 cases concerned physical assaults, seven concerned neglect, three concerned sexual assaults, and three concerned physical injuries unrelated to assaults. The greatest number of cases has come from uh, New South Wales, followed by Victoria, the ACT, and then Queensland. It is interesting, and I would argue that it's actually concerning that there have been no cases of prosecutions in the Northern Territory, Western Australia, or Tasmania. Sorry, I forgot to mention there have been four cases in South Australia. But why uh, it is very concerning that there have been no prosecutions in three of the Australian states. And of course, if crimes are not being prosecuted, crimes against workers or uh, crimes against people with disability, that is, in my opinion, uh, concerning. I'm going to go give you three examples of the cases. And let me say again, this material is confronting. Uh, so if you need to leave the webinar to look after yourself, please do so. The first case concerned the death of Scott Bremner. And Scott was a teaching assistant uh, working in a school inside the Yasmar Detention Centre in New South Wales. He was uh, murdered by a young person with intellectual disability and complex trauma who was on remand in the uh, detention centre for charges including attempted murder with a kitchen knife. At the time of the incident, she was being taught knife skills in a TAFE hospitality class being taught inside the youth detention centre. The school principal stated that she believed that it was pre prejudicial to the students, the staff to know why they were in custody and, that informa uh, and for that information to be used as a basis for removing the students from the courses. The young person killed Scott. And of course, he never went home to his family ever again. That case is from 2002. The fine imposed was $294,000. Another case um, 
which should be labelled case two, is the death of Riley Shortland, a child with disability, his support worker, Rachel Martin, and Rachel's unborn child. And what happened is that Riley exited from, <coughs> excuse me, Ryan, Riley exited from a vehicle. Um, Rachel chased him um, down the highway um, and both Riley and Rachel were hit by an oncoming vehicle. The fines in this case were very low. Um, the not-for-profit provider was fined $90,000 um, and had to pay prosecutors costs of $75,000. The New South Wales, Wales government, which commissioned the support, um, it, this was out of home care support, was fined $150,000 and had to pay costs of $70,000. But one of the reasons why the fine was so low is that the judge accepted that Riley could get out of any uh, seatbelt restraint available on the Australian market. Indeed, at the time of his death, a uh, special restraint had been uh, commissioned and was being designed just for him, but it was too late. The third case concerns serious harm to Eden Kamick, a person with disability who is being supported one evening. Eden, the support worker, Mitchell Hazard, failed to raise the bed rails on Eden's bed and Eden fell out of the bed and sustained injuries, uh, which according to media reports, were the equivalent of those seen in a major collision. The worker's solution to this was to lift Eden off the floor, place him back in the bed, and then take no other action. It wasn't until the next shift came on the following morning that the new uh, worker recognised the distress Eden was in and who was transported to hospital, and the story came out. So they're just some examples from the 27 cases. I'm going to work through nine lessons that uh, we identified from analysing 27 cases. The first one is that providers are responsible for health and safety, even if the risks are created by other, others. So an example of this principle is the Karambi schools, um, special school, school um, prosecution, um, and this was a case where a student with intellectual disability had assaulted a teacher's aide. Contributing to the circumstances on the day were the fact that there was a teacher strike and also the weather was inclement. So the students couldn't be outside and were brought inside. But from the point of view of the court, that, those factors did not matter because after all, teachers do strike from time to time. And yes, it does rain from time to time. And so even if the risks are created by others, it is still incumbent on the provider to ensure the health and safety of all. Lesson two is that where an instance of serious harm occurs, a provider should expect that this will uh, demonstrate failures in its systems. Of the 27 cases we examined, um, there were clear failures in systems in 26 of those 27 cases. It's almost by definition that if serious harm occurs, that an organisation's uh, systems will be found wanting. Because otherwise, why did the harm occur? The third lesson is that a provider's commitment must be more than uh, a paper commitment. A paper commitment uh, according to the courts, is clearly not sufficient to comply with the obligations imposed by the Act. And I'm quoting from one of the judgments here, the employer is required to ensure that its paper systems are implemented and maintained in its daily operation. The fourth lesson is that a provider's quality and management systems must be comprehensive and dynamic. And there's case law uh, 
establishing the view that all system that um, all possible risks must be identified. Now, this particular uh, uh, judgment is the on track case, and it concerned the murder by a person with psychosocial disability of the worker who uh, had turned up to support him. The background to the case is quite unusual. The client had made um, sufficient progress in his recovery, but at one stage he was actually uh, had uh, the assistant minister for mental health come to his house to talk about how uh, his successful recovery. But sometime later, his condition deteriorated and he was discharged from the hospital without a discharge summary. Despite the best efforts of the provider to obtain that discharge summary, they couldn't uh, obtain it. The worker turned up at the, the client's house and the client proceeded to murder him. So this really picks up the principle that a the provider's response must be dynamic. It's not a set and forget process. At one point in time, the uh, client was safe to other people, but sometime later, he was unsafe. And the uh, in the view of the court, the provider's systems failed to reflect that. Our fifth lesson is that providers must identify and manage risks arising from the physical environment. So in the design of group homes, for example, you don't want two stories with staff on one level um, and potential safety risks occurring on the upper level. Or you don't want the design of the group home to congregate all staff and all residents in one confined space. The other examples um, identified in the um, cases uh, were uh, problems with a tilt table, an unguarded machine, and an unguarded saw. Uh, this was in a Australian disability enterprise. The, those last two examples were in Australian disability enterprises. So providers must indeed identify and manage risks arising from the physical environment. Lesson six is that a provider must obtain relevant information and ensure that it is shared with those who need it. Now, this was very obvious from the case of the Yasmin um, Correctional Centre that, concerning the death of Scott Brenner. The, the known risks in relation to the young person had not been shared with the staff. But we see multiple examples of uh, cases where providers actually held information but didn't share it with staff. So in this facts case, that was the case. Um, also in the South Australian Support Services case, which concerned the sexual assault of a worker. Um, that information was known by the provider, but not shared with, it was shared with some workers, but not all the workers. In the particular case had been shared with uh, the workers who had been directly supporting um, the client, but there were other uh, premises, other residents, residences nearby, and it hadn't been shared with workers uh, working in those other um, houses. Lesson seven is the providers' difficulties in attracting and retaining staff are irrelevant to legal requirements. This was established um, in the Victorian Person-Centred Services case. Um, in that particular case, uh, the worker was supporting a client who was known to be responsive to people of colour and also um, he was responsive to workers with which he was unfamiliar. And the provider, finding uh, staffing difficult, allocated a new worker and she was from Sudan. And so it set up a um, huge risk to that worker and that's why the organisation was prosecuted. Lesson eight is that a provider's actions must be timely. Going back to some of the very old cases where uh, the New South Wales um, Disability Services Department was prosecuted, um, by the time the matter got to the courts for prosecution, in some cases, 
the department still had not resolved the very uh, risky situations that were inherent in its service delivery. And obviously uh, that aggravated the offence from the court's point of view. And our final lesson is that in determining a provider's multiple responsibilities, you know, it has work health and safety responsibilities, responsibilities under the NDIS legislation, if we're talking about NDIS services, but in determining those multiple responsibilities, work health and safety rights appear to trump human rights and trauma-informed formed approaches. So in the uh, Victorian uh, person-centered services case, the court said that workers in a residential care setting are owed the same obligation by their employer to provide a safe place of work and safe work practices as any other worker. They should not be expected to endure assaults, threats and abuse by virtue of their occupation. It may be a very difficult balancing act for those responsible for the care of such children to get the balance between trauma-informed dress practice and oh &S obligations right. And the court observed this case is an example of that tension. So as I've observed, um, in some cases, these lessons are really obvious. Uh, it is obvious that information about risks need to be shared. But on the other hand, um, they're also incredibly profound. And I think all providers and all workers, um, and indeed all people with disability, can learn from the lessons identified in the research. Thank you, Alan. That's a really thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, We've got time before we hand over to Drew to uh, to answer any questions. If so, if in you're in the audience, if you've got a question, please put it in the Q and A box. Um, there's a question that you might want to deal with, Alan, which is from Tony, which says, um, "What about client to client assault?" So, can you sort of be clear about what issues you're focusing on today? Um, so. Um... I would include client-to-client -client assaults in a workplace as, as being relevant work health and safety crimes um, where they're, they're you know, intentional acts. Um, of course, in many cases, they will not be intentional, but people are still being harmed. There has never been a case uh, or, or of the 27 cases we identified, there was never a case where a client has been prosecuted for harm to a worker or harm to a client. In some cases, though, clients would have been prosecuted under general criminal law provisions. So, for example, clients who committed acts of sexual assault um, have certainly been prosecuted under um, some of the general um, criminal provisions. Um, and I dare say that will include cases of client to client assault as well. So just there's a question from somebody who probably came late uh, saying, will this be recorded and shared? The answer is yes, the session will be recorded and it will be on the LIDS website by the beginning of next week. Um, and uh, this this uh, person also says he didn't manage to write down all the names. Um, so I should say that the paper that Alan's spoken to and the one that Drew's going to speak to are both published and they're open access. They're available. If you Google their names, you'll find them. If you look on the web, website of the LIDS, you'll find them. Um, and the first author is Hoff and, and for one paper and the first author on the other one is Marsh. So you, if you have difficulty, then just email us. Um, and I, I should mention, Chris, that the... Um... Uh, appendix to the to the uh, first paper, the half paper, for want of a better description, um, includes a full list of all the cases, including the legal citations uh, needed to locate those um, cases. So there's a question from uh, Laura P, who says, from your research, is there much guidance, future recommendations about how to mitigate these risks? I mean, that's going into other territory, but do you want to? Um, I, I think the lessons in, uh, we've identified indeed are the strategies to mitigate risk. 
Um, in my second presentation, this is after uh, Drew, um, uh, I will pick up some of the fine detail which needs to be considered in terms of risk mitigation. Um, and it's relevant to mention that Chris, Drew and I are working on an, another paper uh, on NDIS prosecutions. And, and in that paper, we'll be spelling out in, in quite some detail uh, what are the things to consider in mitigation. And I guess... Um, Relating to this, were the providers where providers are having to risk manage meeting mul multiple legislation? Was anything found to work well? Uh, no. <laughs> um, by the very nature of prosecutions, the cases where things have worked badly, um, and I think it is true that this sort of research needs to be complemented by another body of research, which is looking at when things are working well. We don't have much of that research in the disability sector at this time. There's a bit, um, and I think, the, for example, the research on active support is, is really important, but we need a, a more extensive research program on how do we proactively create quality and safety um, are, are across the range of organisational actors, uh, starting from clients um, through to boards of directors and providers. So if anybody has a spare half million dollars that they'd like to share with the centre, please be in touch. It's interesting, Alan. I think as you spoke, it, it, it made me realise more and more that the lessons about the safety issues and the prosecutions, they can be replicated when you're thinking about quality support. So it's not either or, it's like these lessons are important as the whole picture around delivering safe and quality uh, support and they can be extrapolated um, into further detail around good practice and the, the conditions that you need in place for that. Um, expectations, sharing knowledge, so on. Um, but there's somebody just, I mean, there's a number of comments about how hard it is to balance, um, particularly when you've got people who have behaviours of concern and there's risk to workers as well as risk to people themselves. Um, somebody says, this is a very profound information, Alan. I wonder if we have lost in the transition from institutional care failures for young workers to learn from people with greater experience. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, well, first observation is that many of the crimes we identified, in fact, occurred in institutional settings, large residential settings in New South Wales. I do think there is um, a real point, though. Um, I, I agree with what's behind the substance of the question, which is how do we ensure that new workers, whether they be young or old, but new workers um, are appropriately uh, skilled and are supported to, for example, uh, if it's a person with um, behaviours of concern, how to proactively assist those that person to um, dissipate those behaviours, to essentially remove the risk. Mm, which is about creating supportive uh, environments for people, isn't it? Um, it, it is. Support. Uh, and I should say that uh, this morning I, I was listening to your interview uh, with uh, Laura and um, uh, Laura Hogan. And in the book that Chris and I have edited, there's a chapter on um, by Chris and Laura on positive behaviour support. It's a really good read, even if I say so myself as a co-editor. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Now, there's two questions that are sort of related, so I'll ask them both. Um, so the first is, were there any cases involving sporting situations and sporting organisations? And then the second one, were there any cases or do you know of any cases where there's harm caused to parents and caregivers by the disabled person? Um, because the, the questioner is saying they're not usually reported. Um, in relation to sporting cases, none of the cases we looked at, um, the 27 cases concerned sport, 
Um, however, I am seeing in more general work health and safety prosecutions uh, that uh, you do have, um, uh, I was reading one only this morning, for example, the operator of a swimming pool had failed to uh, consider the safety of all participants um, in, in at that pool. Um, so I would expect that across time we will see uh, more of these sporting cases and also recreation cases. So um, in Tasmania, we, we had that dreadful case up at Burnie with the jumping castle. And that case is, is still before the Tasmanian Supreme Court. In relation to parents and caregivers, um, um, there's some very important work which has been done on the issue of assaults of parents and family members. Um, and Chris, you'll be able to uh, prompt me with the name of your American colleague uh, uh, who did that, um, spoke at the ACID conference a few years back, um, um, or perhaps not. Um, it might come to me in due course. <laughs> I'll just ponder that. <laughs> and also worked by Jennifer Clegg from uh, Britain. Um, um, the nature of work health and safety legislation is that it depends on the existence of a workplace. So if it is the assault by uh, one family member of another family member, which is a uh, home, which is not a workplace, then of course it's not subject to workplace health and safety law. Um, if it is a home which is a workplace, um, it might come within the province of the law. Um, so that'd be a question I'd, I'd defer to Drew. So in, in yeah, terms I, of, yeah. <laughs> so it's Clifford, it's Stacy Clifford Simplicon, That's, who is an American uh, researcher in sort of uh, politics policy area, who is actually a family member of somebody with a quite severe intellectual disability and very challenging behaviour, but has written uh, at least one, possibly two articles about um, particular instances where uh, family members have been killed or severely hurt by somebody with very challenging behaviour. And she sort of points out, and as does Jennifer Clegg in her work, that we very seldom hear or talk about or tackle those family issues. Um, they tend to be dealt with in sort of closed areas and, and we don't sort of go there and ask about those situations and it's really important to think about them as well. Um, so I can give you those references, whoever it was, if you want to send an email, I can give you those references or put them in the um, chat. There's a did you want to say something, Drew, or not? Uh, no, we'll come to the law stuff. Um, so there's a question, two questions again. So you made the comment at the last lesson was that quality and safeguard legislation trumps human rights, I think. Um, so the question from somebody is, does quality and safeguarding legislation trump state WHS legislation? So can you talk um, a bit about that? Yep, so lesson nine was that in determining multiple uh, responsibilities, it appears that work health and safety rights trump human rights and trauma-informed approaches. Now, you'll note that we use the word appears, um, and that was quite deliberate. Um, there are a number of cases uh, which appear to establish this principle. Um, I am aware of one unreported judgment, which we couldn't include in our research, where a court has recognised um, the principle of uh, dignity of risk. Um, but yeah, it, it does appear work health and safety uh, principles seem to trump the more general, uh, say, NDIS uh, legislation, even though there's issues around uh, you know, Commonwealth law and state law, and, and usually the principle is Commonwealth law prevails over state law to the extent of any con inconsistency. Um, but there's also uh, preservation provisions under the NDIS Act for some of the state law. Um, that's starting to sound complex, which means I should stop and not go into that. <laughs> so just to follow that up, and maybe 
either of you might want to think about this. Does the the new idea from the Royal Commission about disability rights legislation having a, a, a disability rights act would that then at a Commonwealth level trump everything else? Simplistically, yeah, but I, the, the challenge with that, so that's that's a that's a semester in constitutional law, just to answer that question. <laughs> um, and the, the basic principle is whether or not the disability, whether Commonwealth Act covers the field and therefore is intended to displace state legislation. Um, and, and Alan and I have actually discussed this at some length um, in the course of these articles. Um, courts take a much more nuanced approach though, and generally they don't intend, they don't assume that the Commonwealth seeks to override the states. I mean, there are obviously some very obvious examples where that's the intention. And because you're talking about primarily a workplace domain, there is, the courts will make an attempt to try and um, read both as being legitimate. So the, the, the trumping is, is kind of an exception um, and, and what will be interesting, though, is the pressure that it may place on um, state governments in terms of how they apply their legislation. So, so I'll touch briefly on the, that question of human rights. <clears throat> um, and I think we all need to acknowledge that Australia is, on a, is only on the beginning, in my view, of really embracing a human rights approach generally. So only three jurisdictions have human rights legislation um, and, and, and we arguably haven't fully um, incorporated or adopted um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. So there, there's actually a temporal dimension to this that um, we, we hope is changing, but those sorts of questions around jurisdiction typically, typically get considered in the drafting of legislation. So that wouldn't be... Uh, I would expect it to be on the radar of any drafters to know that, to recognise that that it's going to raise potential conflicts, and and that's better to resolve that in the in the policy um, settings rather than wait for the courts to take a view, unless you intend it. And of course, we know all the cases where federal government intends to override the states on particular points, but this is not one of those areas. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question for you, Alan, from Jane. She says, how should boards of management uh, ensure the organisation is doing its due diligence in practice by workers? Um, hi, Jane, and thanks for that question. Um, uh, I'm going to give the cheats answer, which is I wrote a paper which is published in Rapid, uh, which is uh, open source, so anybody can access it, uh, called... Uh, governing for quality and safety in disability service provision. What can disability service providers learn from others? And so we talk about uh, the due diligence principles um, under Section 27 of the model law in that paper. Um, is there anywhere that does it well? Are there other countries that we can learn from? Uh, it's, well... <laughs> Without being um, a smart aleck, it, it sort of depends on what you mean by doing it well. What aspect of are we talking about? Um, we don't have good comparative knowledge. We've got, we've got knowledge of comparative work health and safety law. We don't have comparative knowledge of work health and safety law as it applies to disability or comparative studies of disability regulation. Um, so... Um, I, I could certainly talk about you know some of the cases I know from Britain, but I, I think it's just um, uh, selecting cases at random rather than being considered view. So I won't do it. <laughs> okay, so the answer is we're not we really don't have that knowledge about the comparative um, pros and cons of the different systems, and they are quite different, aren't they, in different different countries? Um, just going back to what you said at the beginning. Um, why do you think there's a difference between the states in terms of the number of, of um, prosecutions and also why is there such a difference in the in the fines that are imposed? Um, so what uh, was identified amongst the 27 cases in terms of the difference between the states and territory uh, responsiveness 
um, is reflected across work health and safety prosecution generally. So for example, uh, Tasmania has very, very few uh, work health and safety prosecutions. Whereas, you know, you go to Queensland and there is a dedicated prosecutor who does nothing else uh, but work health and safety prosecutions. So you get this tremendous variation between states. In terms of the fines, um, I'll just uh, make two quick points. One is that because we were looking at cases from 1999 onwards, a fine at one particular point of, you know, early given in 1999, if it was converted to uh, 2024 uh, uh, pricing, um, of course, it'd be much greater. Secondly, um, it's curious that the courts have been reluctant to impose maximum penalties in work health and safety cases. You compare that to, uh, say, the recent prosecution by the NDIS Commission. I probably shouldn't use the prosecution application for a civil penalty by the NDIS Commission in the federal court, where on one of the for one of the offences, um, the um, court imposed a maximum a penalty which was 99.8 percent of the maximum figure now you never see that sort of percentage being imposed in work health and safety cases why um i think it's uh historical uh in part drew would um give a longer explanation about uh, sentencing principles in criminal cases, um, um, but we probably don't have time for that fuller explanation. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so on that note, we might have a, a like a, a minute break while we get Drew slides up, and then hand over to Drew, who's going to talk about the implica implications of the cases that we're in Alan's study, what are the implications for policymakers and regulators? So Drew, do you want to share your slides? This is uh, Drew, who uh, is a senior adjunct lecturer with the Public Sector Research Group at the University of Canberra, University of New South Wales in Canberra, but is also the chair of Golden City Support Services Board, amongst other things. Um, all sorts of things. So over to you, Drew. Yeah. yeah, look, so so thanks for inviting me along. And look, it's been a really interesting collaboration with Alan because um, hopefully as, as displayed in the pictorial form on the screen right now, I've got a, quite a varied um, uh, experience in both disability and health and safety. So I have spent time at WorkSafe. Um, I've acted on the other side of the fence, um, both in a corporate sense, but also with community, the community legal sector. Um, and I've got a perspective, obviously, through um, being on the board of a disability support provider. So what I hope to bring in this is just, I guess, a range of um, perspectives that, that um, or at least a range of perspectives inform the interpretation that um, collectively we put on on these case, um, this case examination. So I'm going to go through the seven um, lessons, I guess, that we identified that um, we recommend are taken up by primarily um, lawmakers or policymakers and regulators, but also recognising that there's probably a role for advocates and the people who support people with disabilities to, uh, I guess, be aware of and, and push for um, uh, improvements in, in, in the approach. So the first lesson really um, Alan has touched on already, which is um, an expectation that regulators don't ignore the work health and safety crimes that um, are perpetrated against people with disabilities. Um, we were speculating as to what that, you know, what, what the reason might be. I think we should start with being clear on what <clears throat> the duty means in this context. And so in addition to the primary duty that applies to the protection of employees, um, all jurisdictions now have a duty that applies to the protection of health and safety of other persons and that they not be put at risk um, from the work carried out by um, typically an employer and interestingly, um, I, I had a, a, a sudden thought that maybe this is a relatively new duty. And as you've seen, a lot of the cases we examined were New South Wales cases. So at about 3 a.m. last night, I got onto the old Occupational Health and Safety Act of New South Wales and found that, in fact, there was a, a similar sort of duty right back to 2001. 
And so this is a duty that's been around or an expectation, an extension, if you like, of the employer's duty um, for some time. <clears throat> and yet, as Alan indicated, uh, we identified at least six cases where on the appearance of the prosecution, it, it, the, the regulator appeared to overlook the disability or the person with the disability who was impacted by the, the failure to comply. Now, we know that regulators are, have a growing appetite for using this duty. And so some of you in Victoria will be aware of the, the, the tragic circumstances on um, Swanson Street when a billboard fell over and um, and took the lives of three um, bystanders who were, who were at a tram stop. So we know that regulators um, are aware of this duty and, and, and have used it um, strategically. The question, I guess, is why, if and why they're not um, considering people with disabilities or, or actively considering it. And perhaps some of the reason might be that um, what we've seen more recently, and in fact, since this, this article was published, um, the, the significant action by the NIS um, commission in terms of um, using um, penalty civil penalty proceedings um, to take to, to uh, take enforcement against um, failures under that scheme. So uh, I think that there's probably partly a lag explains why regulators haven't looked, but also um, you've got to raise questions, I guess, around what the strategic objectives of regulators are. So regulators, and, and, I'm, and I acknowledge I work for one myself, not in this space, but I work for myself. Regulators don't have infinite resources. They have to make strategic choices. Um, and prosecution usually sits at the, at the top of the compliance and enforcement pyramid. Um, and there, there is a significant amount of work and investment that goes into uh, a prosecution. And it's it almost always will be um, guided by what are the objects of the legislation? What's it trying to achieve? So, um, we, I think I look at the this this area for improvement as um, an observation. Um, it, it is what is revealed from our analysis of the case studies. It doesn't necessarily mean that cases are being actively ignored, um, but the, the 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 net effect is when you look at the the, the twenty seven cases, there is um, a bias towards. Um, uh, taking action where an employee has been impacted and we question why when the duty exists and the regulators are responsible for that legislation, um, why there isn't an opportunity to, to take more action um, where, where an opportunity presents itself. So I guess what we're asking for is um, for, for active consideration of um, ensuring that, that le the legislation is protective of people with disabilities. The second um, observation we made is really around the way in which um, certain um, risks are characterised, but also the control measures um, that are that are um, adopted by organisations in trying to meet their obligations. Now, the Alan's given a good, um, I suppose, overview on on this concern about there being a at least a perception that workers' rights trump the rights of people with disabilities. Um, in the early New South Wales cases, we can say it wasn't an appearance. It was a. It was clearly spelt out in the cases. There's at least three cases in which um, the judicial member um, went through a process of weighing up, but ultimately said that the workers' rights more or less trump. Now, I think it's important to note. Well, firstly, you know, that as authors, we reject this idea that there has to be a, a, a or that there should ever that we should even conceive it in terms of being one rights against another. Um, and I think that the opportunity really needs, or we need to grasp the opportunity to take a human rights approach, whether it be in the safety context or in disability support, um, to approach the use of prosecution as an opportunity to uphold human rights generally. What's worth noting too is, of course, a lot of the cases where this um, concept of workers' rights was pitted against the rights of the people being supported predates um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, and so, as I said earlier, there, there is arguably a bit of a lag happening in, ter in terms of the way in which um, Australia generally is picking up or adopting a human rights approach to um, particularly the work of government. And so, especially in my home state of Victoria, there's an increasing recognition of the need, of the expectation that all decision makers, all government um, decisions are um, taking into account human rights where they're relevant. 
Um, and for those who are, who are interested, there was a there's a, a VCAT, so our Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal um, uh, decision recently, a planning decision in which the court um, or the, the tribunal was persuaded that the human rights of a person who would be impacted by an overlooking apartment, in this case, um, a child living with um, autism who periodically um, used the backyard um, uh, very creatively to, to um, run around with his clothes off. Um, the parents were really concerned that um, his right to enjoy his home and to, to express himself as he felt right would be impacted by the particular development. And the court was persuaded that the human rights charter in Victoria applied and that the decision needed to take into account his rights. So there's, there's, there's some murmuring, if you like, there in where, or at least it's a good indication of, of how human rights can be integrated in decision making. But what, what I'm really interested in is how work health and safety regulators are start, and courts are starting to conceptualise the role of a behaviour support plan. Um, and so, I mean, my view, and I would expect the view of most on this call, is the behaviour support plans are primarily there to enable an individual to realise their full potential. Um, what we've seen in some of the cases is the courts characterising them as risk control plans. Now, a behaviour support plan done well has the benefit of um, potentially managing risks by um, meeting someone's needs and, and, and in fact that's what we'd expect a good behaviour support plan to do. But narrowing it down to simply being a risk control measure is, is a bit degrading and, and certainly doesn't connect with the real purpose of behaviour support plans or the original purpose. What, what we suggest in the paper and, and would argue quite strongly is that when putting it into a work health and safety context, um, we should recognise that a behaviour support plan that helps meet the needs of the individual is a kind of a risk, is in fact a way of eliminating or, or minimising the risk of harm by simply avoiding the, the escalation of the behaviours in the first place. So while we can see that it plays, uh, it may play an important role in managing risk, we sh it should be characterised from the outset as being um, informed by the, the concept that if you meet someone's needs, then the, the, the escalations will tend to be minimised. And we've certainly seen that in uh, the organisation I chair, that that, that worked to great, um, great effect. So I suppose what we're asking here is for regulators, work health and safety regulators, to really um, take the time to understand positive behaviour support, active support, and recognise it as um, part of and perhaps the primary way in which risk is managed in, in that setting. Um, the third observation, and this really builds on some earlier work um, that Alan and I have been involved in, in, in trying to understand what the drivers and the motivators for work health and safety and the NDIS legislation were to see why they were drafted in ways that are quite um, uh, individual or distinct. Um, the an important part of the history of the work health and safety legislation is that early on in the development um, of this approach to regulation was um, tripartism. So this is the idea that in order to get the best outcome um, in the legislation, and in fact, in the implementation of it, you want to bring together the employer, the government and the unions or the representatives of the, of the um, workers. Now, the concept of tripartism um, has been really championed by significant researchers like um, John and Valerie Braithwaite. I know John Braithwaite, most of you, I, I would hope, uh, would be aware, um, is, is, is uh, the, one of the designers of responsive regulation and the pyramid that the NDIS Commission adopts and many of the OHS um, regulators adopt. Um, but what he, what he realised later and, other, and through other research that in fact um, there's probably in social, in human services and social services, there's probably a need to consider quadripartitism. Hard to say the word, so maybe that's one of the reasons we avoid at the moment. But essentially, this is um, expanding that that um, collaboration to include people with disabilities or the people who support people with a disability, and recognise that, and, and perhaps building on the the duties that apply to people, other persons, they need they need to have a voice in the way in which um, health and safety legislation. Is, is crafted, but also applied. Now we see that as really consistent with what the NDIS um, 
now expects in terms of inclusive governance. I mean, it's just a basic expectation now that you that you know nothing without us and nothing about us without us. And so I think that there's an opportunity to actually take what is what has proven to be an effective mechanism um, to, to to develop solid legislation. Um, and of course, you know, in, in, in the context that we're focusing in here, um, we recognise that yes, engaging people with an intellectual disability might be a bit more challenging, but it's no excuse um, to, to exclude them from consideration. Um, the fourth um, observation <clears throat> really started with um, some the, the old OHS legislation in New South Wales in which um, the way in which the the prosecution rights were drafted, um, it was a possible for a union to initiate a prosecution um, under, under the OHS Act. And so quite a number of the decisions that um, Alan profiles in the first paper and that you'll find in the database uh, were actually union initiated. Um, the, the modern day version of that, there's no longer uh, a direct right under any of the WHS jurisdictions, but there is an opportunity or a right to require the, the regulator to investigate a, an apparent breach of um, the uh, legislation. And so, and in fact, in New South Wales, in New Zealand, I'll tell you, New Zealand, where they've adopted the WHS model, they've actually retained that um, private right to prosecution um, in order to give people a broader opportunity to hold um, employers to account. So the section that I was mentioning in the WHS, it's 231 in Victoria, it's 131, but this is an ability to compel the regulator to reconsider or to consider for the first time um, an allegation of non-compliance with um, the legislation and the regulator needs to be accountable for, um, for that decision. Um, this is really an opportunity for um, the community generally, perhaps advocates in particular, to um, uh, maybe address that apparent um, imbalance between workers being um, work incidents with workers being preferenced over people with a disability. Um, the other thing that's probably worth noting, and this is again an asymmetry, if you like, in the rights of people impacted in a workplace that aren't employees, is they don't actually have the benefit of the workers' compensation um, scheme. And so um, other schemes that have these third party rights, in fact, create um, an ability for a person to um, seek compensation or some sort of redress for the harm that's been um, sustained. And so I guess that asks the broader question of whether there's a role for restorative justice or a restorative justice approach, um, which is, is starting to, to gain some traction in New Zealand and other places, um, and, and certainly is worth um, Australia considering as a way of um, addressing what appears to be a little a bit of a bias. The next one's probably a bit a bit provocative, um, and you know we're interested to 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 see what 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 the community makes of this. But um, we noticed in a number of cases, and in particular um, the tragic case of Nisha Jamir in in um, we, where as part of so this was a, a, a support worker who um, uh, was supporting uh, more than one person in a setting where um, he was an. Uh, they were unable to, to um, uh, well, the, the setting was a beach setting. Um, one of the people that they were supporting headed into the water. Um, Nichelle went in to try and rescue them and, and, and lost her life as a result. Um, amongst the reasons um, reported as to why um, the, it occurred was that they had asked for funding um, for a second support worker and that had been refused. So that raises the question, well, what is the NDIA's role in um, in, uh, in the OHS or the WHS system? Um, we also identified a policy, um, uh, and I think I should have NDIA rather, NDIS, my apologies there, um, that was published that said, sort of essentially disclaiming any direct involvement in the, serve, uh, in the um, uh, rostering of staff. Um, it's, it's unclear what the, the reasoning was behind that policy, but one interpretation is perhaps cynically um, a desire not to get too involved because of the, the potential liability. But the reality is the Work Health and Safety Act, there's a Commonwealth version of it. It applies to federal agencies. Uh, Work Health and Safety, all Work Health and Safety Act duties apply concurrently. So to the extent that any party has capacity to influence the safety outcome, 
they owe a duty of care um, to the workers. And so this raises the question, should there be uh, an expectation on funders to wear some of the, the risk when it comes to work health and safety um, uh, impacts? Um, the, and this has probably been raised in some of the questions and it certainly it deserves to be, to be addressed um, as directly as we can. Um, some people have incredibly high and complex needs and that's a, that's a question of fact. It's not something you can easily develop policy around uh, or at least um, it can't be addressed through, through um, ignoring it. Um, and, and then it's with people with some of the most challenging behaviours that, that, that some of these cases have arisen. Um, we recognise that the market-based approach under the NDIA a is um, potentially incentivizes organisations to avoid people with the highest needs if they're not going to be able to be fully supported um, in, in terms of their funding to be able to um, provide the supports in a safe way. And so there is this risk that there are a cohort of people in the community who are going to be overlooked because of the a purported risk or the apparent risk they present to the organisation. And that's understandable from an organisation's point of view, but collectively that's really not good enough. Um, importantly, we are not aware of any guidance um, that's been published by any regulator, although I'm interested to know what, what um, Alan's found in terms of Victoria recently, but um, the, the, there's, there is scant guidance on how to, how uh, providers are expected to meet their safety obligations in the context of people with the highest um, needs in terms of behaviour. And really what we're working on and what, what we put together here is, is that comes from the wisdom of hindsight, which is, is easy, easier, um, easy to say once it's happened. So we've put forward a, a question on is it possible or is it, a, is it appropriate for the work health safety regulators to get together with NDIA and NDS, NDIS to agree on what is a reasonably practicable approach um, that will satisfy um, the, the requirement to do all that's reasonably practicable, but also in a manner that takes prosecution off the table. Now in Victoria, um, there is a power to issue compliance codes under the OHS Act. If you comply with a compliance code, you're taken to have met your duty. So there is a there's a model, if you like. Um, the codes of practice under the Work Health and Safety have an evidentiary status. It's not quite the same as the Victorian. Um, so there, but there is an opportunity for regulators to be very clear on what what um, what what satisfies compliance. Um, we would urge the regulators to actually converse over these complex issues and come up with a view that means that support disability support providers um, are incentivised or properly supported to, to um, offer services to everyone in the community. And the final one, uh, it's fair to say the authors had a bit of robust discussion on this, and that's probably partly because coming from a legal perspective, I've got a, a view on sentencing guidelines, um, as does probably everyone in the community when you think about it. Um, and I suppose I, as a lawyer, you're trained to recognise the court is independent. Um, it exercises its discretion as an independent arm of government. Um, so I think we need to be careful, you know, what how we approach this. But <clears throat> certainly, what we observed in the case study was the case studies was really no clear trend on um, what being a not for profit uh, means in terms of a, an appropriate punishment. Um, I think we found sometime after publishing, I think Alan found some some general guidance in, in the UK, but it wasn't really clear enough or wasn't um, granular enough to really um, necessarily translate into our context. Um, but there is, there's a vexed question as to what is the impact on a particularly a small not-for-profit um, on the people that they support um, if their funding is impacted by a significant fine. Um, so we pose it, I suppose, as some questions, you know, should the not-for-profit status be a factor in weighing punishment? Um, and what about government agencies by comparison? We're a bit clearer um, on what we think is appropriate with government agencies. Um, certainly some of the cases we're aware submissions were made to say, well, if we 
if you find us this much, this this much of the budget will be impacted um, for the support of people um, with, with disabilities. And we don't accept that as an argument. We think that particularly with government, it, it, government agencies need to be treated on a similar footing to um, other organisations, um, particularly where um, they control or have access to more funding. But we raise it as a question as to, you know, what, what guideline, how, how should a court be supported to, or how should a court in, in, interpret um, the impact that uh, the penalty is going to have on the organisation and the people who rely on that organisation. So final slide, um, and this has been raised uh, to some degree by Alan, but I think it's important to note that while this is a a really robust set of cases, 27 cases is no small number to, to be analysing. Um, it's not a it's not a, a, a population sample of all decisions made uh, in, in this context, and by by their nature, prosecutions tend to be the worst case scenarios, um, and often the reason for prosecution is broader than than just the issues that we're raising today. So we recognise that there are some some caution needs to be applied to to some of the lessons we've drawn. Um, and the, th the big, a big part that's missing, certainly from my point of view as a regulator, is that lots of small decisions that get being made probably on a daily basis, particularly through remedial notices, um, in which we, we don't have any real um, visibility as to how those decisions are being made. Are they getting that balance right or are they doing a better job in terms of um, providing a safe workplace but also re re recognising the quality of life for the people um, supported in those workplaces? Um, it's a real gap, I think, in the knowledge, and, and, and I certainly um, would love to see some of those decisions, that, that next level of decisions, to be analysed in a similar way that Alan, Chris and I have gone about um, examining the case law, which is publicly available. In particular, I'd like to know what is the work health and safety regulator's understanding of positive behaviour support and active support? You know, is there is there some recognition of um, the way in which it can tend to re um, reduce risk if done well? And ultimately, I think our conclusion, uh, the one thread throughout all of the observations is that we, we, we expect um, the reg safety regulators, the Commission and, um, and uh, the NDIA uh, to, to really um, engage more fulsomely and recognise the, the shared challenges. So I'll leave it at that and pass back to Alan. No, oh, you're going to pass back to me first and then oh, Alan. <laughs> So, Alan, will um, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Um, well done. Okay, that's good. Um, so there's there's about uh, ten minutes uh, if we need it for questions and comments from people. Um, just one first question for me. Right at the beginning, you talked about um, the Braithwaite's and the prosecution being at the top of the sort of regulatory pyramid. Um, yep and education and things underneath that. That was the approach of the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission, wasn't it, for, mm -hmm. for quite a long time, and that seems to have shifted to going to prosecution. Do you have sort of comments about that shift and what that might, yeah. the implications of it? Yeah, so my to my knowledge, um, they still retain that same pyramid. So what essentially what the pyramid approach allows a regulator to do is to look at the toolkit it has, what are all the things they can do as a regulator to um, hold people to account, to influence behaviour, to improve standards, and then essentially arrange it in a, in a tiered way. And, and essentially, you want to do most of your work through the, the, the bottom of the pyramid, which is information and guidance, assisted compliance, so the sort of collaborative, dare I say, softer approaches to regulating. And the top of the pyramid is reserved for either making an, an example of bad behaviour or um, holding someone to account or a bit of both often. Um, what I think you're observing, Chris, is called the regulatory pendulum, which swings like this. Um, and so perhaps what we're seeing from the Commission is, um, is probably better explained by politics, the Royal Commission, um, more funding. Uh, anyone that heard, I... I, I almost ashamed to admit it, but I, I caught um, Bill Shorten on, um, uh, I'll say, one of the commercial stations recently, and, um, you know, he, he was making the the observation that he's more than doubled the, the, the size of the NDIS Commission, 
So th there's probably a simple explanation in terms of if you give a regulator more resources, they'll do more. <laughs> I think what I'd like to know though, Chris, is is the same amount of effort being put at the the mm. sort of support to comply end. Now that was really clear from the Royal Commission, and that that came out long and loud and clear that it expects NDIS Commission to really uh, the Safeguarding Commission to invest in. Um, practical ways in which people can improve the quality of, of the um, uh, uh, quality of life for the support providers. Um, it, not so much, I mean, there wasn't so much addressed at the safety, but certainly that, that if done well, the regulator really doesn't just choose between them. They, they do the full suite um, in order to get the behaviour change that they're, they're seeking. Alan, did you want to add something? Uh, no, uh, no, thanks, Chris. I was uh, uh, just uh, agreeing with Drew whole, whole, whole okay. So uh, there's a question from Anonymous, um, and I'm not sure about this, but maybe you can have a go at it. Do you have any thoughts about work health and safety when it comes to the delivery of complex health supports? Uh, I think that comes under your slide around complex supports. The psychological impact for workers who are being asked more and more to deliver support that in the past has been the remit of nurses okay well um so i, I won't i don't have any specific um knowledge of that shift in arrangements um certainly psychosocial risk is is increasingly um of concern uh, by regular all safety regulators and so there was a code of practice published, a, I'll say, a year or two, um, raise, really raising the bar on all employers, not just in this sector, across um, all sectors, um, uh, expectations of employers identifying and putting in place ways of minimising that risk. And it's a very detailed and, and quite comprehensive um, uh, code of practice, which means it's, it's there as an evidentiary standard. Um, and it's and it's interesting because it applies in uh, indu industrial settings that haven't typically had thought they've had much to do in the OHS space. Um, probably the disability support sector is probably is not quite the same as other white collar. I mean, I'm thinking you know offices which may not have ever had much to do with psychosocial risk, but now have a lot to do with it. Um, in Victoria, there is proposed legislation. Um, being quite prescriptive around what constitutes um, a psychosocial risk and what em um, employees are expected to do. And in fact, a really quite a stringent um, reporting um, scheme around um, reporting to the regulator on psychosocial risks and, and incidents and the like. Um, the way that it's that psychosocial risks has been broken down covers things like agency or level of control over the work they do. So I think there's that raises a really interesting challenge opportunity for um, providers in the in the um, disability support sector in giving choice and control to your workers but when they're trying when their fundamental goal is to give choice and control to the people they support do, does that raise risks I think it probably does there's probably some tensions there and, and again this is our point around we really want safety regulators to better understand the disability support context to understand what are the existing tools, what's being done well, and how do we actually make the integrate these things to work well? So I don't know if that addresses the question, um, but certainly, look, the complex people with complex needs are are absolutely the the most challenging part of um, the regulatory scheme. Um, all the more reason why regulators need to get to really understand, you know, what what may work and promote good practice. I'm not sure they are the most challenging. It's the, the, the su providing support to those people is the most challenging uh, yeah. element rather than the individuals themselves. Uh, Jane, Jane says that uh, her son communicates through behaviour and when he has assaulted workers, she puts in brackets, it's always been in response to those workers not treating him with respect mm -hmm. and, and not seeking to understand and not listening to him. And she reiterates that active support and positive behaviour support are so important to the quality of life for people. And, and then Laura sort of picks up on that and says, do you think there's a role for the NDIS Commission 
to provide more transparency about what exactly they're expecting in terms of PBS providers and compliant actions. It seems that a lot of questions remain unanswered from the Commission, and then they are coming down on providers by applying the top of the pyramid with fines when there really hasn't been clear communication about expectation where there is a lot of nuance. Now, that's a complicated question. Do you? I yeah, guess but I think, like, my, my reading of the Royal Commission with its recommendations on um, disability support providers is very much expecting the NDIS Commission to invest much more heavily in setting a standard. So one of the things that regulators need to do and should do as well as they can is set clear expectations on the standard of conduct that constitutes compliance. So with, with the OHS context, the, the, the onus of proof, the burden of proof and the onus of proof sits with the prosecutor or the regulator to prove that there was a safer way of doing things and that it wasn't followed. Um, but at the bottom end of the pyramid, you want to be promulgating that that um, opinion and that guidance as much as possible to support um, everyone that doesn't end in the prosecution area or isn't you know isn't suitable for prosecution. There's something for them to work to a standard to work to, um, and the commission should do the same absolutely. And I, I I mean my interpretation of that is that the 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 NDIS um, Commission's own motion inquiry, and that was endorsed by the DRC, and that was endorsed by the NDIS review, was talking about having standards, particular practice standards that were around use of active support and use of practice leadership, um, that you actually translate this broad, fuzzy idea of person-centred support into something that's much, much more mm. specific. So you've got detailed expectations like you have for peg feeding and things. And, and that seems to be a slow process of well, talking about that. Yeah, it's something that Alan's mentioned to me, and I, I, I uh, would admit that it, with the NAS legislation, when it comes down to the granular compliance level, you know, I, I, I know bits and pieces, but it's not my area of speciality. But the, the emphasis on auditing and auditing against standards sounds good, but if, if, the, if it's just a documentary process and not a is the active support working? Is it actually achieving obligations? If all you're doing is looking, oh, yeah, you've got a document and it make, conforms to what I expect, that's not the same and certainly uh, not what work, health and safety regulators expect. They want to know that the outcome is achieved, not just that you documented it. So I wonder whether the observation Alan made around, you know, being on paper is not enough, which has been very clear in safety for decades, whether that hasn't yet quite settled with the commission and recognizing that while auditing has a role and um, it's not necessarily enough to just say yeah you've got a system and you're good to go what effective practices is as or more important but if you've got the if you've got the intention in the paperwork that says that and it spells out what you should expect then that helps you to uh, to look at is this actually happening it's yeah. a sort of audit tool almost yeah you yeah. can't replace looking observations, yeah. but it helps to guide observations. I think mm -hmm. that's that's the point. We're going to have to um, stop, I think, because we're going to hand back to Alan. Um, so there was just... It's all right. Um, there was a question about are, are regulators being given education about the disability sector? Um, and I think you've both mentioned that they're not, that that's a sort of a, a gap at the moment that really needs to, to be increasingly tackled. Um, and maybe there are some signs that, that WorkSafe is beginning to think about these issues, Alan, from that report that was done, but there's probably a long way to go, isn't there, in that space? Yes, uh, and full credit to um, SafeWork uh, Victoria for uh, their recent initiatives. I think, though, that those initiatives need to be bolstered uh, by the quadripartite approach, as Drew's discussed. Okay, so thank you very much, Drew. So you'll stay around while Alan's going to do the final uh, presentation, looking at the pro prosecutions by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, some of the first cases, and this is sort of hot off the presses or not quite reached the presses yet, but it's coming. So... Over to you, Alan. Um, thank you very much. Um, and um, even though Drew and I have collaborated extensively um, with Chris on these papers, it was uh, great to hear it presented orally and 
I picked up some of the subtleties uh, that I uh, previously not grasped. Um, Drew, can I just ask one question, um, if you're still available? And is um, the use of the word prosecution uh, correct in the case of a civil court? <laughs> Or should I be oh. talking about an application? I, I think the same question every time I see a sign on, on a farm that says trespassers will be prosecuted, which is not technically correct. Um, I, I don't have a I don't have a good enough answer. In fact, I'm scared of civil penalty law. It's very new um, to Victoria. It, it, it tends to be more of a federal tool. The federal government tends to avoid criminalising. Um, requirements if they can avoid it um, uh, so I think it's I think it's acceptable I think people understand what you mean and I'm I, I wouldn't yeah but I can't give a definitive answer <laughs> uh, thanks so much Drew well before while you're finding that Alan I'll just read out a comment from somebody uh, the last comment from one of the service providers said the head of the quality and safeguard commission in November told us their offices will be attending people's homes and questioning what people understood of the regulator's role and provider's responsibility without notice. Um, two weeks ago, the new head said that would be unlikely that they would be doing that. And he says, when there's clarity about expectations, they have a chance of them being met. Um, so thanks for that comment, Steve. Um, I think a lot of people would probably agree with you. So back to, back to you, Alan. Thanks, Chris. And um, just to mention the NDIS Commission has released um, only this week um, a survey of people who have contact with the NDIS Commission. So um, you'll find the link to that on the Commission's website. And I'd encourage everybody uh, to be sharing their views about what the Commission has done well and what it might improve. So um, just to put the issue in context, NDIS regulation is, of course, just one source of legal responsibility and potential liability. We've already discussed work health and safety law, but there's also criminal law, there's actions for negligence, there's breach of contract. Um, so don't think that uh, when we talk about how there's only six cases, that doesn't mean that people aren't pursuing their rights through other means. One of the things to note about the NDIS legislation is that the requirements under, under the legislation are absolute. Um, and I think this is um, very much demonstrated in the prosecution of Oak Tasmania, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so um, because these are civil penalty proceedings um, and the way the legislation is structured, there is no requirement um, for when the Commission is taking somebody to court to prove uh, that there is intention uh, as exists under criminal law. Or, for example, um, in work health and safety law, the standard is that the uh, employer or the PCBU must uh, reduce risks as low as reasonably possible. And so, um, to use lay language rather than uh, a legal meaning of defence, um, you, if you can demonstrate that you've done all that's reasonably possible, uh, then you're not going to be held liable under work health and safety law. There is no comparable provision uh, in the NDIS uh, legislation, and I think there should be. We've had some mention of um, the imposition of financial penalties. There's two forms of penalties which uh, can exist under the Act. The first is that workers and providers, and this is whether they're registered providers or not, can be given infringement notices. Now, these are sort of a, the equivalent of a parking ticket, because it, if you get a parking ticket, it's issued by an inspector, not by a police officer, typically, and, not, uh, and you don't have to um, uh, necessarily front court. Um, but the difference between the NDIS Commission's infringement notices and a parking ticket is that the NDIS Commission's um, infringement notices are much for much greater sums. Um, so if you're a worker and the Commission pings you by way of infringement notice, the penalty for the breach uh, per breach is $3,756. 
if you're an organization, then whenever the act uh, says uh, the penalty for an individual is X, then the amount that applies to a corporation is five times that amount. So $18,780 per breach. But the um, greater amounts of money are to be found in the civil penalty proceedings, which is where the NDIS Commission applies to the federal court uh, for the impos imposition of a penalty. And so in the case of workers, that's $78,250 maximum. Um, or in the case of providers, $391,000 uh, and a bit of loose change uh, maximum for corporations. It's important to note that these are penalties per breach, not penalties per incident. And we'll come to the significance of that in a moment. Registered providers, in addition to uh, penalties for breaching the code of conduct, can be subject to uh, civil penalties for breaching conditions of registration. And the amounts uh, that can be applied are the same. So if you're a registered provider, you can be pinged for breach of the code of conduct and also for conditions of registration. But wait, there's more. Um, so in the proposed aged care legislation, um, it will include civil penal criminal penalties for directors and executives of providers, as well as for providers themselves. Now, if whatever is established in aged care, I, I think we can absolutely assume that that will be flow, uh, flow that will flow on to the disability sector. So we could, are likely to get criminal penalties applying in the disability sector as well. So far, there's been six um, uh, applications for civil penalties initiated by the NDIS Commission in the Federal Court. Um, and I've um, been assembling the documents which are publicly available. I have also been applying um, as a citizen for uh, third party access to the Federal Court's documents. And I've placed them uh, on our SharePoint. And if you're uh, interested, hopefully that tiny URL link will work for you. Um, if it doesn't, please uh, just contact me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to share the materials with you. Um, so six so far, a Ford prosecution, the Australian Foundation for Disability, a uh, large national provider based in Western Sydney. That prosecution has been concluded. Um, there's the Integrity Care South Australia prosecution application. Uh, that's been adjourned pending the outcome of the proceedings for work health and safety uh, offences and um, uh, criminal neglect leading to death um, against the directors um, as, as well as work health and safety action against the provider. Uh, so those cases were before the Supreme Court and the federal court case has been adjourned until the uh, criminal cases are heard. Third case concerns Aurora Community Care Proprietary Limited. Um, I note that there are a number of disability service providers called Aurora. I'm only talking about Aurora Community Care Proprietary Limited. That case is in progress, but to the best of my knowledge, it appears that that um, uh, organization has gone out of existence. And I fear that we will see more of these um, uh, small for-profit organisations avoid uh, their legal liabilities simply by, you know, stripping the assets of the organisation and um, cease trading. Um, I'm not saying that that has definitely occurred in Aurora's case, but I'm, I am intrigued by uh, what I've found out so far. The Live Better prosecution has been uh, concluded. Um, there's uh, another one which is in progress against Valmar Support Services, uh, an organisation based in country New South Wales. And then we have a major prosecution of Oak Tasmania Incorporated, which was only um, commenced in the past few weeks. So to take the two concluded cases, the first is a Ford 
Australian Foundation for Disability, this concerned the death of one of the people they were supporting or supposed to be supporting by the name of Myrna Apram. And Myrna had intellectual disability as well as epilepsy. Um, and as a result, she experienced a seizure whilst bathing and uh, drowned. Um, the commission took action against a Ford for unsafe practice and the fine imposed in relation to that was $220,000. It also uh, took action for an unsafe environment in that the Myrna had locked the bathroom door from the inside and there was no easy way for the workers to open the door. They actually resorted to, I think it was to a knife and um, removed the lock in that way. For that breach, they were subject to a fine of $180,000. At the time, this was the biggest ever fine imposed uh, in any context in relation to disability service provision um, in Australia. Of course, no amount of money um, ever compensates for the harm to the individual and the ongoing suffering of the family members and, and uh, friends of the individual who has been uh, harmed. I do stress that um, this incident occurred under a Ford's previous management and not under its current management. The second concluded case is with Better. Uh, by coincidence, it's another case concerning risks in bathing. So this concerned the death of Kia Lucas as a co consequence of sport, uh, scalding, scalding when having a bath. Kia had an unusual um, syndrome, uh, and forgive my pronunciation, but I think it's pronounced something like Cornelia de Lung's syndrome, and show, she had, um, was at huge risk in relation to hot temperatures or hot water. Um, she was being supported in relation to her bathing one day. The workers thought that the uh, bath was at the appropriate te uh, temperature, having tested it themselves by the hand. After uh, Kia was uh, supported into the bath, Kia was nonverbal. After two minutes, they, the workers recognised that Kia was in distress and uh, removed her from the bath. So, but it was too late because the scalding, I understand, set up um, burns, which led to infection, and Kia subsequently died of these injuries. The entire incident, which resulted in her death, was just two minutes long, a maximum of two minutes, which really reinforces to us um, the importance of being uh, acutely aware of how um, risks can, can be realised in, in unexpected ways and in very short times. Lit Better uh, was subject to an application by the NDIS Commission to the Federal Court, as I've said, in relation to unsafe risk assessment. Um, and for that, they received a, a fine, which was 85% of the maximum. So that was $235,000 for failing to assess the risks properly for unsafe practice. Sorry, 235,000. For unsafe practice on the day, uh, they received 99.8% of the maximum penalty. So a penalty of $277,000. For unsafe training, uh, the, the penalty was about 32% of the maximum. So that was 92,000, but that was applied in relation to each of the workers. And there were seven workers involved in Kia's support across time. And so that was a fine of $644,000. And for failing to assess the workers' competence, uh, another fine, again, $92,000 by the seven workers for $644,000, producing an overall penalty of $1.8 million plus costs. So this is now um, the most significant case we've ever had in Australia in which providers have been prosecuted uh, for uh, failing to provide safe support I suspect this is the biggest fine the world has ever seen. 
in relation to unsafe support by disability service providers. So what are the implications for providers? Well, the first one is the obvious point that amateur hour is over. We need to be very professional in our approach to disability service provision. Most harm that occurs in the sector is not deliberate. Of course, there's exceptions such as, you know, the vial abuse we saw on 60 Minutes against Leanne Mackey. But in, in most cases, the harm is not deliberate. As we saw in Kia's case, the serious harm can occur very, very quickly in unexpected ways. They supported Kia with her bathing on 80 previous occasions without harm. It was the 81st occasion which produced the tragic result. Um, it really highlights the importance for providers of risk management, of intake controls, of ensuring that information is shared with those at the front line, the importance of shift plans, of quality training, which must be tailored to the unique circumstances of the individual. So Live Better did in fact have training on bathing for their uh, workers, but it didn't reflect Kia's unique needs. There needs to be tailored com competency assessment. There needs to be what's called situational awareness by frontline staff being alive to the possibility that things could be going wrong. There has to be appropriate practice leadership. There has to be practice in clinical governance. And I think providers need to also be aware of human factors, uh, which include cognitive biases at work. I suspect in Kia's case, there was a cognitive bias at work in that the provider had given the support on 80 previous occasions. So what could possibly go wrong on the 81st? That's speculation on my part, but I, I do uh, genuinely suspect a number of cognitive biases were at work. Now, as I've laid out all of those things which must be achieved, anybody who's involved in disability service provision will know that each of those issues has practical challenges associated with it. But it is essential if we are going to um, stop preventable death and preventable harm that we as providers, as workers, um, address these issues and do so in a really systematic way. I just want to end on implications for policy and regulation practice. <laughs> Uh, and I recognise that for some people, especially people with disability, um, will be outraged by any discussion that does not simply blame providers. And I want to put that blame to side for one moment and think about what we need to learn more generally. Australia, with uh, the Australian disability sector, along with the Australian aged care sector, are now one of the most regulated sectors in Australia. And I suspect our disability sector is the most regulated sector in the world. Um, now, of course, there's been only been six cases, but I think there's been 180 or so infringement notices issued. Um, you could say, in fact, six cases is entirely inadequate. But on the other hand, if the harm that occurred to Kia had occurred in, in a hospital setting, then the fire, there would simply be no fine um, under NDIS legislation or, or the only fine which could have been in, imposed would be under work health and safety legislation. As a researcher, I'm frustrated about the lack of transparency about infringement notices. Um, we have, um, apart from you know, a one sentence description, um, of what's occurred on the NDIS Commission website, we really don't know and therefore can't learn from uh, the experience which led to infringement notices being issued. It's also of concern that the Commission has no discretion as to the amount of the infringement notice uh, that can be applied in an infringement notice. It's a set figure and the Commission ha has no discretion under, under the legislation to vary that figure. I think we are seeing regulatory creep occurring through prosecutions. Now, uh, the example is in relation to competency assessment. We of course need competency assessment, but can anybody point me to a requirement for competency assessment in the practice standards? 
No, they can't because it's not there. Uh, we've got regulatory creep occurring. As I flagged, we've got policy equity issues. Why are there differences between registered and unregistered providers in the sorts of penalties which might be imposed? Why are NDIA and its officers not subject to the same scheme that providers and workers are subject to? And yet, as Drew uh, uh, identified in relation to the death of Nigel Gimro, um, it is alleged that the NDIA and its officers um, refused uh, appropriate support as requested by the family and the ratio of support was one to one, whereas the family had requested two workers to support their child. Um, there's issues for other indirect funders um, beyond the NDIA, um, hospitals and non-NDIS related disability services. So there's a range of policy equity issues. And finally, I think there's policy efficacy issues. Especially reading the uh, documents in the federal court in relation to Oak Tasmania, my question on reading the last section of that document about cases where clients have been harmed or potentially harmed was why are the individual workers not being prosecuted? The commission has the power to do that under the act and I wonder why they had not been prosecuted. I also think there's a very interesting question, a legal question, legal philosophy question of should providers be held responsible for action of workers beyond their control? And um, re recently I've been reading work in relation to what's called system intentionality about that. When should organisations be liable for actions of their workers? I'll stop there, Chris. Thank you, Alan. That's really thought-provoking, I think. Um, and there's a number of questions in the chat. We've got a relatively short period of time left. I just want to ask you, you point out about the lack of competency and uh, sort of articulation or assessment within the NDIS quality and safeguarding sort of regulatory system and that disability is far more regulated than other areas. Is that partly because in other areas such as health and the medical profession, for example, the regulation happens through professional bodies and qualifications and training, and that's where the competency is assessed in those that sort of uh, qualification uh, professional area rather than in the workplace, whereas in disability it's because those things don't exist, that it's all left to the workplace? for it to um, happen? I think in part that's the case. Um, the other part of the explanation is that the majority of health providers are government. So government doesn't actually like imposing penalties on itself. And um, it's also about the power of uh, the health professionals, uh, particularly doctors, and the power of health unions. Okay, so there's a lot at play there in that, so why is it then that disability is so over, so regulated compared to other areas? Um, I think for two reasons. One is we have had a substantial history of terrible uh, examples of abuse and neglect in the disability sector, as documented by the Senate Committee of Inquiry, the various commissions of inquiry um, established in the states, um, and. Uh, so we have a real challenge to improve the quality and safety of the sector. The other explanation is I think we're political, that the uh, disability service provider sector is politically weak compared to other sectors such as the aged care uh, sector um, and uh, some of the uh, medical bodies. Um, John Braithwaite would argue that one of the reasons why the aged care sector has historically been underregulated is because of the uh, amount of donations which are made by the aged care for-profit providers to a certain political party. Okay, um, there's just one, well, there's a couple of questions, but probably an easy one is, uh, are, there, uh, this, are there the same standards, expectations of registered versus non-registered providers? Uh, short answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, 
all registered and unregistered providers are subject to the code of conduct? No, only registered providers are subject to the practice standards and uh, the additional uh, penalty provisions that breach of those standards attract. So just one comment, um, I guess, to end, and then I'll talk about the next seminar. Uh, this, uh, somebody says, I'm new to this sector and I'm stunned at the lack of rigorousness in providing clinical supervision as mandatory as required in other areas of human services. Communities of practice seem to be non-existent, which, non which could strengthen skills and knowledge sharing. I, I think I think that's an issue, Alan, you might want to just pick up about the language of is it clinical or is it practice supervision and is it practice governance that's missing? Can we just translate the stuff from the health sector into disability or do we need to think about it a bit differently? We need to think about it diff uh, differently. We need both uh, governance of practice and also where clinical support is provided or where clients have clinical needs, there needs to be clinical governance in that context. Uh, but we don't need to inherit, import the entirety of the clinical um, governance arrangements from the health sector. My standard joke is we don't all need to be running around with the Bristol stool chart in our hands. Yeah, because we're, we're, we're delivering social care and support rather than health care. Okay, so thank you, Alan, and thank you, Drew, for a fantastic uh, seminar. Um, what I want to just talk about is, so the slides will be available on the Living with Disability Research Centre website. The recording will be available by the beginning of next week. If you've got any queries, you can contact us through the generic uh, email address which you use to get the link to the seminar. The next month's seminar will be on the 10th of July. And that will be around the theme of neoliberalism, what it is and why it matters. Um, and it will be previewing uh, much of the work that's in a new, fairly easy to read volume, which is written by Jennifer Clegg and Richard Landsman Welfare, uh, which is about neoliberal and neoliberalism and intellectual disability. And the second half of the seminar will apply their analysis about neoliberalism to thinking about the way the Royal Commission went about its work. And it's a really interesting analysis um, that they have. Uh, so please join us. We'll send out the information about next time's seminar um, in a day or two when we've formatted it uh, together with the link to their book, uh, which is a relatively thin volume, but is a really good read. So thank you once again, Alan and Drew, and thank you, Yelena, for moderating the tech behind the scenes. Um, and we'll see you again next time, everybody. Thank you for coming.